Allez, let's get going. The home run, last step. You've been quite uh, energetic. I mean, it's seven hours a day of conference uh, and then all the breaks. Seven hours a day of uh, being fed uh, uh, interesting stuff, uh, learning new ideas, uh, exchanging, and all the rest of it. And you're still there. And you don't even look tired. I can't believe this. I can't believe this. Yeah. So, here's the plan. We are going to try to make this session uh, lively. Uh, I was supposed to give an opening statement of eight minutes. I won't do this. I will give you concluding statements at the end. Uh, and we will go directly into a six-person panel. Basically, well, what I would say is tell us uh, what you want to tell us. Uh, we, are at the end, we are at the end of the conference. So, so for me, it's really free speech. Uh, we try to give uh, the, the best of what we, we had those last three days, and maybe we try to look forward. We like to look forward because I don't believe that anyone here wants this just to be, OK, a nice bracket in our life uh, where we had good time together, and then life goes on. À la sauce, uh, Dombrovskis, or uh, no, don't, don't quote me. Uh, voilà, so let's get going. Uh, I will go to my seat so I can introduce you the wonderful speakers we have. And we have had only wonderful speakers, actually, maybe with a few exceptions, but okay, I won't elaborate. Uh. Alors, so we start with Tim. So, Tim, I read your book. When was it actually, uh, Prosperity Without Grudge? 2009. Okay. And we are in 2023. That's the year I was elected in the European Parliament. Really. 2009. You were very swift. You came off the block very quickly. Yeah, okay. Um, and I read Peter Victor also at that time. Uh, uh, so, very interesting stuff. But indeed, you were part of our first edition five years ago. Uh, you came to this one. Uh, well, basically, the floor is yours. I don't need to introduce you, I think, to this crowd. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. Thank you to Philippe. This is an extraordinary event, an extraordinary closing of an extraordinary confidence. And you don't need me to tell you this discussion doesn't happen here in the hemisphere every day. I know it's difficult to believe, but it's true. Come Monday, or perhaps even tomorrow, this space is at risk of being reclaimed by the mantra of growth. <laughs> Philip's opposition to that has been legendary, and um, he's engaged in that struggle with a sense of calm purpose, charismatic humanism, and a very deep commitment. This conference is a testimony to that and the culmination of that commitment. So thank you, Philippe, and your team for bringing us here together again. Okay, that's half my 10 minutes gone. <laughs> I want to start in a slightly quieter place. Last night, I was invited to a salon at Full Circle, just a few minutes down the road from here, to speak on the theme, imagining a post-growth economy. The room was full, conversation was lively, the debate was invigorating. And then, right at the end, a young woman asked me, what does a post-growth economy have to offer to a generation fearful for their future. A high school teacher emphasized the same point. He'd lost sight, he said to me, of what to say to his kids when faced with the same question. And it struck me not for the first time there is no easy answer to this question. It's easy to see that anxiety is in part a reflection of the deeply dysfunctional nature of our economic system. It's in part a result of a kind of dream we have tried to sell our kids sell ourselves a fantasy that it's always possible for everyone always to have more and more, that there are no limits to our aspirations for material progress. 
that technology can solve all our problems, that the economy can expand forever. This is the myth of our time, the myth of growth, the mantra that guides our political thinking, our economic science, our sense of progress, that more and more is always possible. And now, and you don't need me to tell you this either, that myth has become dangerously unraveled. It's bequeathed the climate in crisis, an unprecedented loss of nature, it's triggered financial instability, it's legitimized austerity, it has contributed to war, it has been possible for the few only at the expense of impoverishing many. Our pursuit, our obsessive pursuit of economic growth has even blinded us to what mainstream economists now recognize as a new normal, a gradual decline in the growth rate, not just because of Ukraine, not just because of COVID, not just a hangover from the financial crisis or the misplaced austerity that attempted to fix it, but a secular stagnation across the OECD nations that has been creeping up on us for decades. This new world is one we are totally unprepared for, a place where conventional economics has no real answers, a place where fairy tales of eternal economic growth, as Greta Thunberg called them, are leading us not towards paradise but towards disaster of the dream that was our culture, to paraphrase, to paraphrase something Camille Claudel, the sculptor, once said, this is the nightmare. No wonder our kids are terrified. But their question remains, how can imagining a post-growth world help us here? I believe it can help in three distinct ways. It can turn the concept of limits on its head. It can focus our minds on core characteristics of a post-growth economy. And it can bring into focus, more clearly than ever before, the nature of the struggle we now face. Let me say a little about each of these things in the time I have today. When the Club of Rome published its Limits to Growth report back in 1972, Economists and politicians lined up to condemn it. There's a famous quote from Ronald Reagan. There are no great limits to growth, he said, because there are no limits on the human capacity for intelligence, imagination, and wonder. Shortly before the pandemic in January 2020, another remarkably insightful US president gave a speech in Davos condemning climate activists young people with exactly the same anxieties raised in the salon yesterday. To embrace the possibilities of tomorrow, he said, we must reject the perennial prophets of doom and their predictions of apocalypse. They are the heirs of yesterday's foolish fortune tellers. Our hero gazed across the savannah of upturned faces towards the horizon of endless possibility. Paradise is a land forged by a frontier mentality. Burn it down, dig it up, build it over. Progress is a construction site. It may look messy for now, but tomorrow's condominiums and shopping malls will be a glorious sight. Let those who doubt this vision perish. The school kids, the climate activists, the extinction rebels, they can all go to hell. This Rejection of limits is a massive cultural blind spot. The relentless pursuit of more blinds us to human nature. It prioritizes, it institutionalizes voracious greed, but it neglects our deepest needs for belonging, for connection, for community, for a sense of purpose and meaning. It precipitates a casual, swipe right consumerism that promises the world but leaves us ultimately endlessly unsatisfied. Characterizing prosperity as the relentless accumulation of wealth is nothing more than a denial of our humanity, a denial of the interdependent web of life on planet Earth, a denial of death. It appears to offer us consolation but it cannot extinguish the anguish in our souls, the longing for something deeper. Now we're on difficult ground here. If we 
teach our kids there are no limits at all, they will become disillusioned, dysfunctional adults. But if we suggest that the world is a dark and foreboding prison full of limits, they will never achieve their full potential. But retrenchment and denial are not the only response to the reality of limits. Adaptation offers a far more creative alternative. Human and earthly limits, properly understood, said the conservationist Wendell Berry, are not confinements, but rather inducements to fullness of relationship and meaning. Beyond our material limits, beyond growth, he was suggesting, lies another world, a place worth visiting, an investment worth making. Beyond the limits to affluence lies an affluence that only limits can reveal to us. Limits are the gateway to the limitless. I believe this insight is part of an answer to the anxiety expressed yesterday so eloquently. A way of looking at the world and being in the world that allows for realism but encourages aspiration. But to make progress on that insight, we need not only to challenge the rejection of limits, but to revisit the definition of prosperity, to ask again and again, what can prosperity possibly mean on a finite planet? If we are to replace the narrow definition of prosperity as wealth with something meaningful, I'd like to suggest there's a blindingly obvious starting point. The foundation for all our prosperity, the foundation for all our wealth is health. Health is one of the things people identify when you ask them about their priorities in life. Our own health, our family's health, our community's health, our planet's health. And this idea of prosperity as health guides us away from growth because health is not about having more and more. Health is about balance. It involves what Aristotle called a virtuous balance between deficiency and excess. It positions itself directly counter to the myth of growth. And something quite surprising follows from this. To deliver prosperity as health, we need an economy whose guiding principle is care. Amongst the many excellent side events at this extraordinary conference was one that focused on the challenges of the care economy. I spoke on the panel there, and I promised to bring some of those ideas back into this plenary today. In fact, my own argument was that it should have been a plenary event in the first place. The care and attention of one human being to another and to the conditions of living lies at what Nancy Fulbright called the invisible heart of the economy. While Adam Smith's invisible hand is busy insisting that we're all selfish consumers, Fulbright pointed out that without care we are nothing. Our children would lead stunted lives. Our children would lead stunted lives. The sick would find no respite, the dying no solace. Our societies are nothing. Our progress means nothing. Without care, there is no economy, not even at the most basic level. The COVID pandemic brought that home to us forcefully, but its lessons are already slipping from our minds. They must not be allowed to. The care economy is not just a sideshow in the search for a post-growth world. It is the blueprint for it. Feminist economists have been making this argument for decades. The lion's share of care work, paid and unpaid, is done by women. And quite possibly, because of this, care work has been denigrated in modern society, not accidentally, not inadvertently, but systematically. Capitalism externalizes the burden of care in much the same way that it externalizes nature by counting the wrong things, by valuing the wrong things, by focusing on narrow defi definitions of productivity that privilege profits over wages and working conditions, by rigging the rules of the game, and by refusing to change. And this brings me to my 
third and final point. There is no doubt we are confronted with a profound dilemma, perhaps the most profound dilemma of our times. Growth is unsustainable, but the world beyond growth is frightening. We have built an economy that's dependent on growth. We must learn anew how society works when the economy is not growing, how welfare systems work, how financial systems work, how government works, and we need to confront the impossibility theorems presented to us by those who resist change. If you think you are looking at a dysfunctional system that benefits no one, then you are probably not looking hard enough. The fine words and supportive gestures of those who cling to power hide vested interests intent on sabotaging progress. And this is where our allegiance to care must be tempered with realism. Our compassion for each other toughened with an iron resolve. Our infinite creativity grounded in a sense of struggle. To wake up each day to a sense of security and comfort is a beguiling vision for our lives. To wake up to a sense of struggle can take our breath away. And yet that struggle provides another kind of answer to the challenging question posed to me last night by that young woman. How can a post-growth economy help a generation to face a future filled with anxiety and doubt? not through a rose-tinted sense of blind hope, not through a false promise of more and more, not by vague assurances that everything will be okay, but through a commitment to struggle. The antidote to despair lies not in hope, but in action, in agency, in engaging with all our creative energy in the task ahead, a path through the limits, towards the limitless. A prosperity based not on wealth, but on health. A struggle to unravel the systematic distortion of values that lies at the core of a broken capitalism. And to construct in its place an economy of care and craft and creativity fit for purpose on a finite planet. And that is why I close as I began with my profound thanks to Philippe for his engagement in that struggle over so many years now, and in particular, of course, for bringing us all here today. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Well, you have a talent of uh, bringing the vision together that is, uh, I would say, not just uh, always the same, but always improving. So you will always surprise me. Dominique, je suis absolument ravi de t'avoir ici. Uh... I'm delighted to have you here, Dominique. And I. Uh, I have enjoyed reading your um, opinion pieces in Le Monde and hearing you on the radio, but that's another matter. You're also, well, like Tim and others, you're part of that generation that wanted to question the economic paradigm. And you really had to be courageous to do that because uh, trends are changing, but back then, it really did seem that the bunker was very well protected. So I'd like to give you the floor, and you're going to remind us of something that happened in 1972, the same year that the report about limits to growth came out. And it uh, wasn't really picked up much. So this is one of Ursula's predecessors. She was here a couple of days ago, and now you're going to talk about uh, someone before her. You have the floor. 
Merci beaucoup, Philippe, pour... Thank you, Philippe, for the invitation. Thank you, Philippe, and thank you to Irla and Francois for this uh, excellent uh, conference and to everyone for their support. So, this conference is the start, not the end. It's the uh, opening phase of Beyond Growth. And it doesn't mean that we're going to radically move away from growth. It means that we're going to have to get out of the cognitive framework that was introduced with modernity. And according to it, production and consumption, so more and more consumption, would be the main aim of our societies and the main criteria for performance. And it's That's what we need to break away from. We need to break away from this um, cosmology from Bacon and Descartes, which uh, put uh, nature there as a great benefit for uh, humanity. We need to break from this uh, attempt to conquer it. We need to think about what we heard in the text in 1949. We need to adopt representation of a continuum of uh, by. Oh, community. We need to respect this, we need to love it, and we need to take care of what we have. We need to make this break, and this is something that we've been talking about over the past three days. We've been talking about uh, GDP. We should adopt other indicators. Maybe we need 100, maybe we need 500, or maybe if we only had two or three. We need to think about health and the carbon imprint and the carbon footprint. We need to look at those. We need to move away from the idea that, of course, we have to produce and consume more. We need to uh, go back to what we had in antiquity. We need to go back to sufficiency. And we need to make sure that we adopt these principles. Will we be able to implement this kind of program? And I'd just like to pause on that point briefly. I'd like to just remind you of uh, points that were made several times. So these are ideas that were uh, never implemented. As Aurora Leluca said, my colleagues and I talked about these ideas. We've been doing that for the past 20 years. We've been supporting the presidential campaigns. We were taking part in international conferences. We were talking about this with Stiglitz as well. We called for the adoption of the law on new wealth indicators that was adopted in 2015 with a majority in the French parliament. But um, things didn't move on. And of course, we have still stayed on the mind. Margins. And about 50 years ago, something happened. There was an extraordinary important text that uh, was published, and I'm going to talk about it. It was published. It was the Manchot Letter. So just over 50 years ago, in February 1972, uh, the man who then became a president of the European Commission, Sigurd Mansov, gave the broad outlines of a very ambitious program. If it had been implemented, you can be sure that Europe and the world would be in a very different situation today. I'll just remind you who he was. He was a Dutch socialist. He was the vice president of the commission. He worked on um, agriculture. And in December 1968, he wrote a memo on the reform of agriculture. It was focused on production when it came to agriculture. Yet it was the same man on the 9th of uh, February 1972 who wrote to his colleagues, who wrote to the uh, president of the commission, he wrote to the president of the commission, he wrote a letter and he said that we needed to have a radical change in Europe. It would be the only way to avoid a major crisis. He was getting reports about what was going to go into the Meadows report, and he'd been reading them for a few months. And this letter is the outcome of the conversion that this politician went through. And that's why it's very, very interesting. It's very interesting for several reasons. It uh, says that Europe is the place where you could have the most effective, most legitimate uh, policy changes. It included a detailed uh, convincing program which was looking at sufficiency, even though he wasn't using that word at the time. He said that we should drastically reduce consumption 
and that the richest countries in particular should do that. He also talked about a transfer of wealth from the north to the south and he also made another suggestion. This is very important. He talked about the uh, radical reduction of uh, consumer goods and that it could be compensated by... Um, extending the use of these intangible goods, uh, intellectual development, uh, leisure, recreation and so on. And he talked about having these uh, public service goods. He was talking about um, the uh, scarcity of resources. This is something that we're seeing today. He talked about uh, the um, water resources, energy resources, and so on. And to do this, he uh, suggested that there should be European planning of production. It should be linked to national production to produce uh, essential goods in the appropriate way. He um, suggested refocusing um, production and that it should be uh, managed and he also said that we needed to move away from the focus on production. He talked about the GATT rules, which was the predecessor of the WTO, limiting free use of goods and uh, production of non-essential goods was something that he talked about. He said that there should be priority for public sectors over private sectors. You needed to have policies uh, for raw materials and have a suitable tax policy. And he was talking about closed economies, protectionism, bans, and so on. And the substitution of a GNP, uh, he also talked about zero growth or negative growth. And I would quote, he was saying, in the industrial world, the uh, rich world is uh, reducing the material wealth of the country. And this means that we shouldn't have zero growth, but we should have negative growth. So, William Mordos responded, uh, he was rehabilitated later, but he really did criticise the Meadows report. Why? Because it was questioning growth and uh, the American standard of living. And so this was the same thing that happened with the Manhole letter as well. Almost all of the political class Almost all of the press uh, came down on it and they criticised him for questioning growth and prosperity and the standard of life in the Western world. It's very, very interesting. And Georges Marché, who was the National Secretary of the French Communist Party, he was the one who launched the first attack. And it was a very violent attack because at that point in time in France and in other European countries there was a debate about including four new countries in the EU and having a referendum to include those four new countries in the community. And so he used that letter to um, denounce the policies that the uh, European community was preparing he said it was against the workers and against efforts to increase the standard of life. Most of the proposals made by Mansholt are still very current. In '74, he wrote another book. It was about the crisis. Really, you should go back and read him, because these are programmes that need to be implemented today. He said you had to start by drastically reducing inequality, we need to reduce consumption. And he was saying that if the rich don't do it, then the people who don't have as much won't do it either. They won't agree to take that path. He also said that we needed to have a new definition for com competitiveness. And he said that we needed to look at this uh, productive approach. He called for um, more labour and more generally, he supported a society that had uh, non-growth and he said that it would need more uh, work, it would need more human labour. We need to have this ecological uh, conversion. Lots of jobs, uh, you'd need to have a lot of very good jobs as opposed to the bullshit jobs we've got today. But Mansolt also said that we had to get workers involved in the process. Governance of companies needed to be reviewed. Workers needed to be involved in the definition of production because you need to meet everyone's needs, not just some people's needs. So this ecological uh, conversion 
was about trying to guarantee um, living conditions. It's also about creating jobs and changing labour. So you need to realise here, this was the President of the European Commission who was getting those uh, suggestions. So what do we want? The EU is the right place for planning uh, steps towards carbon neutrality and using renewable resources. It's also going to be important when it comes to looking at the way in which energy is produced in the future and uh, services and industry. This was the starting point. We've had the starting point in the Green Deal and we need to speed up the strategy. But, of course, there are going to be lots of obstacles that we have to overcome. There's resistance from a lot of people involved. S the rules that we have are still imposed on the world and we have uh, budgetary rules that are not suitable in Europe. There's a contradiction between the need for a just transition and massive investment in the green transition. But in Europe we still have the same restrictive budgetary rules. There are about a dozen European research, Piketty, Pormanyed, myself for example, we're going to publish a text and we're going to say that we need to have uh, this democratic hand on the Maastricht Treaty. We need to have the right budgets, we need to have a progressive approach whenever it comes to fortunes, we need to look at the profits of multinationals. Philippe Lombard has made some proposals that are very similar. He did that in Economie Politique, which is a magazine that just came out, and he has written an article in it. But just to conclude, I talked about something 50 years ago, I talked about something 20 years ago, but really, is there anything different today? Why um, would we be able to change things more today? Well, I think that there are more of us, you can see that today, and through these three days we're starting to speak the same language in Europe, we're sharing the same culture, and we're doing that across borders. I think we've got the shared heritage. We've become a collective, we've become a community. These three days have shown that we can have a strong alliance between researchers, social partners, uh, politicians, citizens, NGOs. So this time we are on the right path. Let's put on the pressure and let's decide to meet again every six months so that we can look at the progress that has been made with new indicators. And if we do that, then we will give a new meaning to the word progress. Thank you for your attention. Merci, Dominique. Thank you, Dominique. Dans ta conclusion... Well, in your conclusion, at the point where you were saying every six months, you know, I was looking at Léa Françoise anxiously. You know, the time and energy it took to uh, organise this. We can't do it every six months, Esther. You are leading the European Trade Union Confederation. And I remember preparing the first conference five years ago. Of course, we had a lot of support. And the final event, by the way, was in, in, the, in the Trade Union House. But I, I, I will never forget an internal meeting where some trade unionists basically attacked me, saying, well, you attack growth, but you know that we need growth for social security, and so we cannot live without it. And, and basically, it was quite abrasive, actually. Uh, I would say that, well, since five years, things have, uh, have, uh, have strongly evolved in, in, uh, between us, and uh, now you are totally part of the game. So the floor is yours. So, so, thanks, Philippe, and congratulations on what I'm told is the Woodstock of Beyond Growth. So, uh, so congratulations again on that. And I want to begin by thanking you for inviting us, because it's no small thing to invite trade unions. Um, uh, we represent, the ETUC represents 50 million workers and their trade unions. And I want to begin by thanking all the trade unionists out there, 
who are the front line of this struggle for a fair and just economy. And you're right, Philippe, it's, this is a difficult discussion for us because we have a lot of skin in the game. So I want to be very honest in, in how I'm approaching this discussion. As many of you know, I hardly ever read from a speech, but I have one in front of me because I've thought very carefully about what I want to say. So, like many of you, trade unions are and have been raising concerns about the use of GDP or GMP as a measure of well-being of nations. The most obvious problem, I don't need to tell anybody in this audience, is that they're simply not designed to measure well-being. So they don't work for that purpose. We also agree, with many of you here, that tweaking at the edges of existing models will not be sufficient to address the economic, societal and envir environmental transformations that are needed. New alternatives are now required and we have one key message that we would really like to get through for the final um, outcomes. And that is that social dialogue and the involvement of workers and their trade unions is essential for a successful transition to a beyond growth economy. As my colleagues in industrial, who I know had an opportunity to take the floor already, say, uh, any, nothing about us without us. So, uh, so, so, so just to acknowledge uh, industrial strong campaign for a just transition. And there are a number of economists who have been advancing ecologically sustainable and socially progressive alternatives. We stand with them in urgent need of a renewed sense of shared prosperity and a commitment to fairness and flourishing in a finite world. That's why I want to focus on the world of work, workers and their wages. We see that there's a need to reset the balance. The beyond has to address the correct balance. We can't import all of the problems of unfairness in terms of work and its remuneration into a beyond growth economy. Right now, living standards are falling across Europe. There's just two responses on the table, more wage restraint and more pressure on working people through higher interest rates. Or worse, what we see coming is a too fast debt reduction requirement. It's going to be discussed in this House. It's going to be dis discussed in this House in the next couple of days. And the call to struggle must, must in the EU recognise that if we don't get the rules right, everything we want to build for a beyond growth economy, public services, all of that will become impossible. So we need to make sure that we're not hampered by a set of rules that will set us backwards. That's why the ETUC is going to be a key part and wants to work with all of you in ensuring that those rules are what we need to have both to secure effective social services but also the investments for the green transition, both of those key to a beyond growth economy. We accept that the growth imperative has shaped the architecture of the modern economy. The European semester is rooted in the growth par paradigm. Take, for example, the constraints of Germany's debt break, a constitutional provision that limits the structural budget deficit to 0.35% of GDP. Now, when it was suspended in the face of the economic challenges following COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine, then there were successful measures put in place to protect jobs and incomes. So the success that was achieved for working people and their communities was achieved despite the fiscal rules, not because of them. That's why the ETUC is again calling for an amendment of the fiscal rules so that we promote green investments, we recognise the importance of, of social spending, both to well-being of the economy but also to competitiveness. The discussion about having a competitiveness check has taken hold in the EU. 
Now, you can't have a competitive economy unless you have social services. Workers aren't widgets. When they come to work, they need to have childcare, they need to have transport, they need to have affordable housing, they need to have training, they need to have a place where they can, can, can live and work. So our message is very clear, there can be no return to austerity. Now, because I was told that there were going to be a lot of economists, I said to the office, I need some figures. <laughs> so, so they said, look, the figure you can use, because we've just done some research, is how much are wages increasing compared to how much dividends are increasing. They said that, that tells a very clear story of, of exactly, as you say, who has the power. You know? So, so in 2022, Europe's largest firms pay, paid out record-breaking dividends of 230 billion in dividends. And dividends increased by 14%, whereas wages only increased by 4%. So I ask you, who's driving inflation? It's not working people. <laughs> Now, tackling prices also needs to be part of the solution because those companies were ripping off workers, but they were also ripping off consumers too. So we need to pay a lot more attention on how much prices are and why the prices are that. So we're calling for a lot more attention and a lot more tools to be able to tackle excess profits. And key to that has to be taxation. We, it's, it's, not, it's not right that somebody has enough money to go to the moon for the weekend and pay so little tax. That, that's something fundamentally, fundamentally wrong, and we need a lot more taxes. So finally then, yes, I'm unap unap unapologetic about it. Workers need pay increases. They need pay increases to be able to put food on the table, put a roof over their head, and to have a future that they and their families can believe in. It needs to be secure work. It needs to be quality jobs. At the heart of that is putting, putting power back into the hands of working people so that they can be active agents in their own success. And how do we do that? We do that by making sure they can join a union without fear and collectively bargain. Recent research in America also demonstrated that in the real world, when you get out of the theoretical models, in the real world, high minimum wages, not only did they not have any negative impact on employment, they actually had a substantial uh, improvement in terms of the number of jobs in America. So I think that re-evaluating the value of work, and I know that um, Adam also, also raised this, we need to look at the value we subscribe to different jobs because so much of it is bundled up in flat-out discrimination. I'm thinking of caring, but I'm also thinking of cleaning. What the COVID crisis showed us, that they're, they're not low-skilled, no-skilled jobs. They're highly skilled jobs, life and death jobs. And yet we pay them, pay them so very little. And there's no justification for, lo for low wages for, for anybody anywhere. There also, needs, I'm nearly finished, I promise. So there also needs to be, in the beyond growth economy, and I'm sure it would have come up by, um, and particularly taken up by the feminists in the, in the group, I'm, and uh, as everybody knows, I'm, I'm, I'm a lifelong feminist, but there needs to be a lot more done in relation to uh, unpaid work. That, 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 we can't look forward to a beyond growth economy. unless we have a plan to, to, to address that for real, for serious. Then finally, the, the other point I'd like to be included in the um, final conclusions is that we really need investment for a successful green transition. We, we hear we leave no one behind, we need no new region behind, but we're still short on the plans that make that a real, a real, a real prospect. 
So there can be no blank checks anymore. All resources or supports that go to industry need to come with conditions, social conditions, and that has to be avoiding redundancies or deteriorating in working conditions. It has to be about reskilling the creation of high quality jobs. And where this sector is, is a sunset industry, then there needs to be a genuine alternative in that community available. And we have to, um, what, uh, and we have, to have that as a real plan. We also need to have a right to training. So much of what's being offered for the future for working people in terms of making the transition is to say, well, you need to get retraining, but nobody can get the time off or they can't afford to get to the course or there's no boss to even bring them to the course on that day. So we need to have real plans that give effect to the principles that we're setting out. So, I want to thank you again. I want to congratulate Philip. Uh, I, I want to give a commitment that the trade union movement is here with you on this journey. How we go about making the change is important, which is why it's so important to involve workers and their trade unions in, uh, at all levels and in all ways. We have our Congress uh, in Berlin next week. This is one of the key items on our agenda, so I look forward to staying in touch for you being part of our struggle for, um, and for us being part of your struggle too, and for us making sure that the economic rules that will be adopted by the end of this year do what they need to do to, to, to support a beyond growth economy. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Well, I can tell you that my co-president, Terry Reinke, will be with you in Berlin uh, next week, and, and uh, it, uh, it is a testament to the alliance we see between, uh, between us and the trade unions. I think that instead of criticizing trade unions for uh, not being enough representative, uh, politicians would be well inspired to, enc to encourage unionization. Because indeed, if we want democracy, we need checks and balances. If we want economic democracy, we need counter power to economic power. And I know of all, no other form than trade unions to do that. This is what needs to happen. And indeed, and indeed there's only one point uh, on which I will disagree with you. I think austerity has to come back. Has to come back in Davos. This is the place where we need austerity. This is really where we need it. Indeed, when you, when you mentioned the, uh, the horrifying, I have no other word, uh, uh, numbers of share buybacks, dividend distributions, I mean, in, in this world, is this still possible? I mean, we... Well, people need to understand that, well, they are not alone on this planet. And if, if this place is sometimes a bubble, I imagine, I can only imagine because I never went to Davos, but I can imagine that Davos is even more of a bubble. Let's burst this bubble. Now, Jacob, uh, my impression is that if I look back the last 30 some years, Economic policy in Europe has been pretty much dictated by Germany. <laughs> and, and, to be honest, and to be honest, what a good surprise it has been to discover at all sides the Zoe Institute, founded by Germans. So who says that nothing good can come out of Germany? <laughs> Jakob, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philippe, for that. Uh, yeah. uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak in front of this amazing um, audience. That makes me very humbled. If you were in this room yesterday, around five, you would have heard the, frankly, quite terrifying intervention by John Rockstrom on the latest news on planetary boundaries. And, you know, we are really not on track where we need to be. It's quite the opposite. And I think it's really no wonder that we are in this situation because you can still 
earn a lot of money burning fossil fuels or overfishing our oceans. And at the same time, you can also still earn a lot of money exploiting workers and make a profit from that and then take those profits and put them to tax havens to maximize them even more. So we are still incentivizing behavior that essentially leads us to where we are right now. And I think that's the conversation that we have to have now. We've talked a lot about social and ecological goals, and I think to really achieve that, we need to speak about how do we create economies very concretely here in the EU in which you cannot win anymore if you exploit workers or overshoot planetary boundaries, but in which you win if you do actual good for people and the planet. And with the Zoe Institute, we have been working very closely with the Parliament and the Commission and the Council, and we're trying to come up with very concrete pathways forward that bring us there. And I want to share three concrete pathways that get us on track to such an economy. And the first thing is, we need to shift the priorities in economic policy making towards what's needed in a 21st century economy to really work. For the last century, the economy has been geared around creating wealth and making the pie bigger and bigger and always bigger. And with the focus on GDP, you know, we were really successful in that. We created a very big pie. The challenge for the 21st century is to redistribute that pie and make sure that we are avoiding ecological breakdown. So we have to prioritize that in economic policy making. And I say economic policy making deliberately, not only because I'm a German economist, but, you know, because with the Paris Agreement, the EU Green Deal and the EU's commitment to net zero by 2050, the general direction of travel is clear, I think. And we also have some great frameworks, you know, that tell us something about where we need to be in terms of social and ecological goals, like donut economics. What is a little less clear still is how the economy exactly needs to look like to really deliver that. So in addition to what we have, we believe we need a new North Star for um, actually, that is irritating. My slides look very different. Ah, okay. Fine, those are old slides. I will deal with that. Let's see. Um, so in addition to that, we need a new North Star for economic policy making to guide us that tells us if the economy is actually ready, you know, to deliver those social and ecological priorities. And that's all we have worked on that in the past um, for a while. And the new North Star that I want to offer you today is economic resilience. And the idea here really is that instead of focusing on making the pie even bigger until we cannot reach anymore, you know, we can create economies that thrive in balance, like Tim said it before. You can imagine a young branch of a tree, you know, and when there are strong winds, it bends a little further away, but it goes back to its original state. And our economies can be like that. We can create economies that are able to handle change and transition really well while still thriving and maintaining the actual core functions, which are, in our eyes at least, you know, providing us with decent jobs, decent quality of life, and room to thrive, and all that within planetary boundaries. So I'm offering you this new North Star to guide economic policy making exactly, directly to these priorities. And what you can see on that slide is how well EU countries are already doing a comparison based on an index that we have developed at Zoe. And then we have to make sure that these economic, social and ecological priorities are actually prioritized. It's not enough to just set goals. We also really have to deliver them. So, dear European policymakers and politicians, here is what you can very concretely do to start shifting priorities. The first thing is, we need to influence all the layers of policy making. We have to make sure that we unlock all the places where GDP is locked in. We need to talk about the narratives. We need to look at the technical level, at the level of where the indicators are. And we need to look at the governance level that describes how the indicators are actually translated into concrete policies. And then we need to make sure that alternative future fit indicators are implemented. So you really got to start using them, you know, in impact assessments, in monitoring and evaluation, and in budgetary allocation mechanisms. And then when we did that, when we have integrated them in actual policy making, those new indicators, we still have to make sure, you know, that those new priorities really happen because, you know, we all know how politics goes. So we need a safeguard. 
And I think a potentially very interesting safeguard is what they have in Wales. In Wales, they have a future generations commissioner. And if you don't know that person, you should look her up because she's really awesome. She's really fantastic. Because of that person in Wales, they will not build any new roads for the next 30 years because she essentially said, you know, that's going to lock us into technology that's bad for future generations. And they're going to build bike lanes and public transport infrastructure and said, how awesome is that? And in the past days, we have discussed quite a range of proposals how such a safeguard could look like at the EU level. One idea that came up was a committee for beyond growth futures in the European Parliament that can be introduced right now to work on the priorities for the next commission. Another thing would be a directorate general for sustainability and well-being in the commission, or how about, like in Wales, we have a vice president for the well-being of future generations in the next European Commission. So there are many concrete pathways forward for the EU to prioritize social and ecological goals. The point is there are multiple options. There are no excuses. So let's get it done right now. And then, I hate to break it to you, but I'm an economist and we need to talk about money. Um, let me check if I have a slide. Oh, wow, my new slides are there. Wow, how did you manage that? I'm very impressed. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, okay, cool. We need to talk about money, and we need a lot of it. We are talking post-World War scale here for the green transformation. According to EU estimates, we need an additional investment of 520 billion to deliver the Green Deal, okay, yearly, additional, on top of what we're already doing. According to others, McKinsey, for instance, they say we need 930 billion of additional yearly investments on top of what we are already doing. And the thing is, 60% of that 60% of those investments that we need, they don't have a business case right now. So they won't generate profits, so the markets won't deliver that. But we need them, otherwise we won't get the transformation done. It's pretty simple. So, dear politicians and policymakers, here's what you can do to mobilize the finance that we need for that transformation. You need to create more 20, 21st century business models to mobilize investments, and for that, active industrial policy is key. And the EU is doing that a bit now with the Green Deal Industrial Plan, which is a good step in the right direction. And you already said it, Esther, we're going to need conditionalities here because it's essential that any government support to green industries, whether it comes from additional EU funds, through subsidies, or in any other way, it's essential that all of that is not just free hands out to any companies. You need to make sure that companies receiving that support, that they are fully on board with that transformation. Only the businesses really, really well suited to the job should get state support. And the easiest way to control that is to tie any government support to the achievement of social and ecological performance goals. And if the goals are not met, you just take the support away again. It's a very simple general rule. Businesses that aren't all in for the transformation, get out the way. Okay, even if we do all that really well, the second thing is, you know, like if we drive in all those investments that work really well, that still leaves us with roughly 25% of those 500 to 900 billion yearly. That's going to be financed by the governments. It has to be. It's like schools and infrastructure and all these things. And the discussion at this conference, I think, showed us very clearly that member states, many member states, they just don't have sufficient room for those investments at the moment. So right now, we risk leaving them behind. And you made a good point about the fiscal rules, so I'm not going to say anything more about the fiscal rules. That's the one thing that we can do. The second thing that we can do, and I think that's essential as well, is we're also going to need EU-level support for this, to have enough investments. And one thing that we believe is quite, you know, maybe the most feasible thing to do at the moment is to have an EU-level sustainable prosperity fund that borrows additional money from financial markets and, you know, invests that directly into green transformation and projects. And then, last thing on money, I promise it, sorry, I'm an economist, last point. I think the money is already there. It is, it's really there. It's just sitting on the Cayman Islands and not doing its job. 
if... <laughs> You know, like the money is extremely and increasingly concentrated in the hands of a few between, and I'm going to add some numbers to yours, between 2020 and 2022 in two years, roughly 26 trillion euro went to the richest 1% on top of what they already have. 26 trillion. We need in the EU overall around exactly that amount to finance the full green transformation, okay? So let's not make it, as Kate said, finance versus life, but, you know, let's use that money instead to create sustainable prosperity for all. And then finally, and I will make that short because you have many concrete points on that. Pathway number three, none of this stuff is going to work if we don't bring people with us on this transition. And right now, we see governments trying to make up for the lost time and the slow progress on the green transformation of the past with measures that are essentially imposed on people without implementing them. And hey, surprise, surprise, you know, they face backlash. You see that in France with the yellow vest, you see it with the farmers, in the Netherlands, there are many examples. And there will be trade-offs. That's inevitable. But let's not make it, you know, livelihoods of the people versus environmental protection. And I think one interesting thing that we can learn from those situations is after Macron failed to implement the petrol tax because of the yellow vests, he created a citizens' council. And he asked the people in the citizens' council to come up with, you know, green transformative proposals. And what's interesting about it is the stuff they came up with was actually much more transformative than the original petrol tax. And it went, like, they had social measures to go along with it. Of course, you still have to implement it. Macron didn't do that, which is a big problem because then you really lose trust of the people. So you should do it like that. It's not what I'm saying. But I think it was really interesting. So if you would implement that, you know, you would have a really interesting set of proposals by the people. So by involving the people, you actually don't slow down the transition, but you make it possible. And with those three points, by having a new North Star, mobilizing enough finance, and taking the people along, I think we can already take a huge step forward towards creating sustainable prosperity for all in the EU. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Jakob. Uh, Curious to see what, mm, I don't know, uh, Christian Lindner might think of all this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, not, now let me go to our two final speakers. It has struck me, starting from Greta, that all leaders of the youth climate movement have been women. I don't think... I don't think this is by chance. I don't think uh, it is by chance. I said that at the opening of, the, of the, uh, those three days, that our current paradigm is pretty masculine, right? Uh, and if we want to find a way out, maybe we need a shift there. And so, Agata, I'll give you the floor, the floor first, and we will finish with Anuna. Agata, over to you. It is an honor to stand here in front of you today among such incredible speakers and guests. Thank you very much for, for the invitation and for giving a space to young people also to express our priorities and our vision for the future. The evidence is clear. Young people and future generations are on track to inherit a planet that is uninhabitable. If we don't act, by 2030, billions of people will lack access to clean and safe water for their needs, and more regions will face acute water scarcity. By 2040, the increasing frequency and intensity of climate-related disasters, such as hurricanes and floods, will leave billions displaced, causing immense suffering and loss of homes. By 2050, the depletion of critical resources like land and fresh water will lead to food shortages on a global scale. 
leaving billions of people vulnerable to malnutrition and hunger. These socio-ecological crises stem from the prevailing capitalist economic system, where our relentless pursuit of growth and profit clashes with the finite limits of our planet and the well-being of people. The past decades of environmental politics have failed to guide us toward human and planetary well-being. We need a new vision of prosperity, one that is focused on meeting the fundamental needs and rights of all, providing a safe and just space in which everyone can thrive within planetary boundaries, one that is based on intergenerational collaboration. So how can we create a post-growth economy that respects all generations? Well, first, we need to listen to their concerns, their priorities, and their vision. So over the past months at Generation Climate Europe, we have worked together with youth organizations, youth networks, and think tanks to co-create that vision for a post-growth society. And youth voices across Europe and beyond have united, calling for an economic system that moves toward planetary and human well-being. We have created a manifesto for intergenerationally just post-growth economy, supported by youth organizations representing over 20 million young people. <laughs> and supported by several academics and experts. This is not just another advocacy paper. This is the call of youth claiming the rights to their future. Through this manifesto, we are urging EU policymakers to transform the current economic system and implement specific actionable policies toward a post-growth economy. We are mobilizing the potential of young people as system thinkers who understand the bigger picture of the crises we are facing. The manifesto gives a comprehensive overview of key elements for a future of prosperity. We are calling for absolute reduction of our resource consumption, slashing production of resource-intensive goods and services such as the meat industry, automotive industry and fast fashion. <laughs> we are calling for prioritizing decolonial justice, for a system for a system of universal basic services, including affordable housing, high-quality health care, accessible education, and public transportation. Intergenerational justice also requires equal employment opportunities and career choices for young people. Too many green jobs remain out of reach for young people due to accessibility and affordability barriers. We are calling the EU to ban unpaid internships across all member states. We are calling for dismantling an already dying and deadly fossil fuel industry and for the EU to withdraw from the Energy Charter Treaty. But all of this cannot happen without meaningful engagement of young people and youth organizations. And that means engagement that is regular, that is not happening on a one-time basis, that is diverse, that is engaging different young people from many different backgrounds. Youth is not just one group with one common opinion. It's engagement that is structured, that means incorporated in the decision-making processes and with a follow-up mechanism. Inviting young people to share their opinions is not difficult. I can assure you that young people have a lot of opinions. It is the key to ensure that these ideas are actually being considered and responded to. Over the last years, we have seen more and more young people speaking in various international fora. But youth engagement has since become a bit of a buzzword, too often used without a solid grasp of what it actually means. And this puts us at the higher risk of youth washing, whereby young people are involved in a superficial and tokenistic way. Millions of young people are volunteering every single day, dedicating their time, their energy, their passion to make our world a better place for all. 
and they don't have the same resources or influence that many governments or corporations have, but they continue to go on because it is literally our lives that are at stake. I often hear from decision makers that with their commitment and action, young people give them hope for the future and that they make them more certain that the next generations will fix the world. <laughs> so let me get things clear. Young people are not responsible for giving you hope. And future generations are not responsible for fixing today's failed leadership. <laughs> hope once we see ambitious action taken by our decision makers. We will feel hope when policies are informed by evidence and science. We will feel hope when the daily news of the climate emergency are not fueling our climate anxiety. We must build an economy that grows the well-being of people and planet, not fills the pockets of the top 1% of the ultra-rich. Extreme affluence drives overconsumption and devastating environmental and social impacts. And these adverse impacts are disproportionately borne by those who are marginalized and living in poverty within Europe and globally. A transition to a post-growth economy is a story of privilege. As the global north, we bear the responsibility to harness that privilege as a catalyst for change. A transition to a post-growth economy is the opportunity to redefine prosperity and progress in a way that respects our planet's limits and enhances human well-being. Post-growth is not yet present in the EU policies, frameworks and measures. At the scale reached, this conference is in fact an exception, showing that there is a growing momentum and support for new economic thinking. These three days have been packed with incredible sessions. It brought together over 4,000 people in person and online. It showed a potential of a multi-party collaboration. And it was made possible by a dedication of, of MEP Lambert and other MEPs, uh, incredibly, and Francois, um, European Parliament staff, the interpreters, and numerous civil society partner organizations and countless others. So thank you so much for your incredible work in making it happen. However, let us not be deceived into believing that the conference itself was the most difficult part of this transition to a post-growth economy. It is what we choose to do next that matters. And I envision the future where we look back at this Beyond Growth conference and we don't see it as yet another talking shop, but a key moment where Europe took a path toward a post-growth economy where we can look back and remember that this is where the idea of the next European post-growth deal grew wings and spread among different institutions. So let's leave behind those empty words and focus on meaningful action. Over the past three days, I have heard academic experts and civil society organizations urgently calling to listen to evidence and to science. And I heard decision makers responding with myths of decoupling and fair tales of sustainable growth. In the opening plenary, President Metzola emphasized the importance of growth we have to deliver now as much as for the next generations. So let me be clear. Future generations don't need our obsession with economic growth. They need a life where they don't have to fight for access to food and water 
a life where they can experience happiness and well-being without sacrificing their mental health, a life where the governments listen to people, a life where they can trust decision makers to take ambitious action based on science and evidence, a life where well-being drives our decisions and policies, a life in harmony with nature, where our planet is flourishing, a life where everybody's fundamental human rights are respected and everyone is able to live a dignified life in comfort, health, safety and happiness. And I am standing here ready to fight for that future. Are you with me? Well, thank you, Agatha. Uh, I think you are confirming that the level of energy in this room remains quite high after three days. Well, probably you are contributing to that like many other speakers, but this is really remarkable. Some uh, parliament staff told me that they never saw that, they, that they see people leaving as soon as possible uh, to, take, uh, to take a drink on the Place de Luxembourg, uh, but not here, not here, apparently. Anuna. The first time we met was in a building of the European Parliament, uh, actually on the Place de Luxembourg, the, the former uh, railway station actually. Uh, and I remember because I had heard, I think the day before, your namesake, Bart, uh, speaking about you as a doom thinker, a doom thinker. And I felt, this is remarkable. I mean, so you have here, well, thousands of mobilized young people who aspire to a bright future and they are qualified by the arguably leading Flemish politician as doomsayers. Something must be wrong, right? With him, I mean. Uh, obviously, uh, he's probably a, a man of the past or maybe he's the doomsayer. Thank you, and, and I'm really happy that Agatha and I got to speak here as, a, as youth activists because I know that we carry a not-so-diplomatic reputation, so <laughs> I hope to live up to that promise. <laughs> I, uh, I want to actually also start by thanking uh, Philippe for taking the lead on organizing this event, because I know that what is perceived as radical changes with the individual context that we are in. And I find it radically brave and courageous of you and your colleagues to put this conversation forward here and set a new bar for this institution. I also want to acknowledge and thank all of the speakers, staff and participants who made this event possible because I've seen incredible people that have proposed radical ways forward. And I know that some of you have fought for these ideas for decades and I can only imagine how special it is for them to share it in a space like this. So thank you for taking the lead on mainstreaming a conversation on degrowth beyond the stage of this hemicycle. What have we done here for the past three days? We are fundamentally rethinking the global economy because we must. Infinite growth on finite resources is not only a myth, but is extractivist and ruthlessly oppressive by design. In essence, it is a system of institutions which determine who wins and who loses in the game of life. So when talking about growth, and defending growth, there is a very important first question that we need to ask ourselves. Who are we growing this economy for? And what stories do we use to justify it? I'm going to say something that is unfortunately controversial to this institution, but it really shouldn't be. If we move beyond growth, we have to acknowledge what lays below our growth. White supremacy, colonialism and imperialism. Yeah. 
And I, I really wanted to join Professor Sultana and the other speakers who made sure this is addressed. White supremacy justifies a global system of exploitation and extractivism. Colonialism lays at the foundations of the European economy, institutions, corporate value chains, trade deals, investment agreements, and geopolitical structures of wealth accumulation, which means that there is no degrowth without decolonization. In our current systems, our economies are growing for some of us on the backs of many of us. Not only must we see and speak the truth about this system, we also have to change it on every level. Talk about the dangerous systems of deadly growth everywhere with everyone and make sure that, they, that every conversation about climate change includes a conversation about its root causes. And that brings me to a second question. Who are we including in the conversations about growth? Some of the conversations we had here may seem radical for people who are only able to think within a system of infinite growth. And that's why we need to have these debates in a radically different way and move from panels to real dialogue. To some of the politicians that were on the stages these past days, I do invite you to switch places sometime and listen to the real concerns and anger of people in this room. We need to take these conversations outside of these rooms and make sure that for all of the hundreds of fossil fuel lobbyists demanding growth, there are thousands of us demanding degrowth. Because if we don't manage to put these conversations into action, we end up debating another 50 years without fundamental and systemic changes. And we don't have that time. <laughs> we don't have that time. <laughs> we all agree. I often hear people tell me that change is complex and therefore slow. I disagree. I don't think change is complex. I think enacting change is simply about changing the stories we tell ourselves to make sense of the world. The idea of scarcity is artificial. The obsession with growth is artificial. And the whole concept of devel development and whatever that means is artificial. And it's a really, really, really good thing that many of us are not buying it anymore. What we need is an economy that scales down everything that is harmful and unnecessary as soon as possible. And establish degrowth is fundamental to the remaining time and carbon budget we have to mitigate the climate crisis. But as Julia Steinberger noted yesterday, there is a massive disparity between the stories of scientists and the stories of policymakers. We are not talking about scientific or economic feasibility. We are talking about courage. European leaders, if you lack political bravery to make paradigm shifting decisions, then leave it to us. Bring us into real decision-making spaces. Organize the People's Assembly and make your decisions in collaboration with the people affected by your policies. Understand that the leadership that got us into this crisis will not be the leadership that gets us out. We want a world of radical abundance, a world in which many worlds are possible, with an economy that serves our needs, a society that celebrates our differences inside a new paradigm that feeds our souls. We are fighting for freedom, not the superficial freedom to work in jobs we don't like, to sell things no one really wants. 
We fight for the deep freedom to build meaningful, meaningful lives without depending on growth. I was asked to end this intervention with a note on next steps. And I think that the necessary policy changes are very clear. We need to redistribute wealth, cancel climate debt, implement a universal basic income, massively invest in loss and damage funds, degrow the economy in high income countries, increase universal public services, reduce working time, dematerialize and reprioritize what it means to live a human life. As Europeans, that means we have to be humble and acknowledge that we don't actually have all the answers. We need to learn from the global majority where decolonial thought leadership has originally developed degrowth thinking. And as a movement, as movements, where do we go? We need to make sure the conversation doesn't end here. If you come from a movement or you belong to a movement right now and you commit to continuing this conversation beyond this conference, please, if you can, stand up. If you consider yourself an activist and you commit to continuing this conversation beyond this conference, please, stand up. And if you are a politician, a scientist, or anyone who commits to continuing this conversation beyond this conference, and I'm looking at my fellow panelists now, especially you, Philip, please stand up. I, I know that many of you have a lot more to say beyond what was said in this, uh, during the past three days. And I want to share this stage with some of my fellow activists by reading some of their key messages that were left out of the conversation. So I want to invite those who have a message to please show it to us. that you can read some of the messages that are on there, but to make it easy, I can voice some of the things that we can read on the boards. Growth kills lives. Stop the fossil fuel lobby. Dismantle patriarchal systems. That was one of my favorites too. Cancel debt. Land sovereignty now. And abolish Fortress Europe. This right here is the movement of movements that Naomi Klein talks about. And I want, the end, I want to end my speech with a quote from her. Only mass social movements can save us now. And if that happens, and we can build a movement of movements, well, it changes absolutely everything. The movements that she's talking about already exist, and they grow every day. We have little time, but we have many voices. And we will keep speaking until infinite economic growth is an old story 
from the past. Thank you. Anuna, now I have understood. <laughs> I have understood by the river when he said you're a doomsayer. I understand for whom you are a doomsayer. <laughs> for his friends, for his friends. Yeah, the battle is not over. Now I'm in front of a dilemma because, well, it's already five past. If we take questions, it's for five minutes. I need really 20 minutes to conclude because we need to give thanks and that's an important part of the thing. So I would say since after the closing of this, this plenary we have uh, drinks, there will be ample time to socialize, ask questions uh, and so much was said in a so energetic fashion. I have the impression that if we go to, to questions it might be an anticlimax. <laughs> so, so how about stopping it here? I will give the closing remarks. You may stay here. You may go back in the room if you prefer. Uh, but let's uh, get to the conclusion, maybe. Ah, yes, my lady, you have the floor. Hear me now? Yeah. Thank you so much for giving the floor and for a question. We acknowledge the efforts that have been put into this conference, but we are in a state of emergency. We are in a state of desperation, and just today, scientists have warned that the world likely to breach 1.5 degree climate threshold by 2027. 2027. So beyond growth will only be possible when committing to abolishing the profit imperative and class society, when acting upon historical responsibilities to end racism and colonialism, when leaving no one behind goes beyond a beautiful mantra in a discourse and beyond Europe. So what are you, commissioners, parliamentarians, council members, concretely committing to when we demand you to escalate our struggle, to cancel all completely illegitimate debt, and to stop cycles of oppression and repression, and to move from the beyond growth towards the degrowth. What are you committing to? For everyone that you mentioned, I'm not a commission member, I'm not a council member, I'm just one of the 705 MEPs. But as a person, I think that my action over the last 14 years testifies that yes, this is the agenda that I, together with uh, my, my green colleagues, have been pushing. And again, we are not the only ones. I think the people who organize this are coming from different political families and I would say that in some families it took a bit more courage to be part of this agenda than in others. And so yes, my commitment to UF, even though, and I will say that in my conclusion, indeed a year from now I will no longer be a member of the European Parliament, yet I will be part of the movement of movements and I will remain. Well, so we've come to uh, the temporary conclusions of our works. So I'm going to do two things. I'm going to give thanks, and I'm going to give a few uh, thoughts about the political follow-up of this. Caveat, 
I'm an emotional person. So sometimes tears overwhelm me. I want to I wanna start with thanks. I want to start with thanks because giving thanks is what makes us human. Well, one of the, of the many things that make us human, and so gratitude should never be a footnote. So I start with that, thanking the 19 colleagues uh, from five political groups, as I said, who embarked into this project with enthusiasm and trust. Most of them said yes at the first meeting. Uh, and we proved by doing that that people here in the European Parliament can work across political boundaries for a common cause. And what a cause, because it aims at no less than making just life possible for all human beings, all human beings. Operation on this shows the way to go. Building broad coalitions to transform our economies so that they serve life and not the other way around. Secondly, I want to thank, and that may sound a bit special to you, Roberta Metzola. Maybe she doesn't agree entirely with, say, the ideas that we shared over the last, uh, the last three days. But when I asked her, she literally opened the doors of our institution to all of us, sparing no effort to make it possible. None of this could have happened if we did not have the possibility to use the incredible facilities that the European taxpayers have given us. If we uh, uh, could not put them at the service of our discussions to have you filling the hemicycle, no less, and all these other rooms, to have all the technical infrastructure for you to join online. And this is symbolically powerful because this is the house of European democracy. This is your house. And frankly, I am incredibly proud to have you sitting in this very room, which frankly, I never ever saw vibrating as it vibrated for the last three days. I want to give a hat tip, uh, well, the insiders know him, to uh, uh, the former chief of staff of Roberta Metzola, uh, who uh, is now the highest civil servant of this parliament, Alessandro Chiochetti. Actually, Alessandro was on the staff of the pre president of the parliament five years ago. It was, it was uh, Tajani, uh, not really the most uh, progressive politician here, yet open enough to say, okay, do it. Do it, we'll support you. And therefore, I would like to ask the parliament staff, interpreters, ushers, security, but also communications, catering, all who, by their discreet yet efficient services, made our lives easy during these, uh, these three days. They have been incredibly professional, and everything was run smoothly thanks to a well-organized partition. I wish to say special thanks to Lucia, who has coordinated all this, to Anna, Lucas, Angelica, Idoya, Barbara, and so many others. I want to thank the President of the Commission and the Commissioners. Five years ago, the President of the Commission basically pushed back, didn't want to have any, anything to do with this. This one, and it came from the very top, said, OK, I'm willing to engage. And indeed, many of you may think that the speech that she delivered uh, uh, two days ago was uh, maybe not exactly the line that you would expect from a post-growth commission. But this is not a post-growth commission. But having the leader of the Commission coming from the European People's Party delivering that speech, frankly, well, this has never been heard from that position in uh, Europe. <laughs> now, we need to push further, and obviously we heard a number of commissioners speaking here who seem to be a bit disconnected with a number of scientific realities, <laughs> but we are going to continue pushing in that direction. But then, of course, we, I want to extend my thanks to the researchers from the European Parliamentary Research Service and the European Commission Joint Research Centre. These are two bodies not very well known. They are doing research 
uh, uh, scientific research, academic research for the institutions. And indeed, it's the first time that they produced papers on what we have been discussing. So it was officially produced. It was not, you know, uh, uh, stuff produced by external think tanks, the internal think tanks basically produce something, and frankly, you, you should read it because it's, uh, it's good material for beginners, I would say, and you know, many people in, in the institutions are actually beginners on this topic, so, so it's well done. <laughs> then there's my political group, the Greens European Free Alliance. Uh, well, the group, of course, we did that in an ecumenical uh, way, but uh, my group provided substantial financial means and also people to make it certain that it would become the success that it has become. We believed in it uh, from the outset, and I'd like to thank Anna, Laurent, Jean, Christian, Simon, Jeroen, Rita, Agnese, Alex, Claudio, and so many more, because none of this would have happened without your engagement. Believe it or not, last time we, we had a, a few partners and starting Esther with the European trade unions, again, from the beginning, right? This time we had no less than 60 partner organizations across really the field of uh, civil society, media, trade unions, I mentioned it. Uh, they have helped us a lot, broadening uh, the scope, the worldview, and I think that all of them have a key role to play to indeed build this movement of movements that you mentioned, Anuna, moving forward. And then I'd like to thank, of course, all the speakers, the contributors who participated in no less than, believe it or not, 27 panels. For their in-depth analysis of the problems at hand, their concrete, innovative solutions and policy proposals, their thought-provoking, inspirational speeches, and by the way, the number of standing ovations that we've got here uh, says it all. And frankly, I am humbled by the extraordinary insightful interventions we had here. I didn't know half of you, and uh, I learned so much. As policymakers, you know, we need poses like this one, because we are, we are not just in a bubble, we are also in a sort of continuous process of you know, doing a committee week, a group week, going to Strasbourg, and, and, and then again we start. Uh, we need to have poses like this to reflect on where we stand, where do we want to go, how should we go there, and mostly to, coll to collectively discuss and imagine what sustainable prosperity actually looks like, to imagine a post-growth Europe, and its relation, and Anuna uh, uh, and Agatha uh, uh, well, drew the focus on that, its relations with the rest of the world, because indeed it cannot be that we keep exploiting the rest of the planet. Well, we are the European Union citizens. We are 6 7% of the global population. There's no reason why we should have more than our fair share of the resources that, 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 that this planet uh, offers to us. I'd like, I'd like to thank Claudia, who has been busy three days uh, graphically recording our debates. Your drawings are invaluable, capturing the very essence of what is being said today, to consign it also to memory and to make it understandable in a graphical way. With, uh, well, sometimes we say, you know, a picture speaks uh, a thousand words. Thank you. Less visible but no less crucial are all those invisible brains and hands, I mean not the invisible hands of the markets, huh? but those of the staff working with the 20 MEPs who have organized the conference. For us MEPs, you know, it's relatively easy to have an idea, let's do a great conference, oh yes, and then someone has to make it happen. And that is of course une autre paire de manches, as we say in French. And uh, among them, I'd like to call on stage, of course, Léa, François and Maino. Yeah, I'm getting emotional. Where is Maino?
Ja. So. Ja, Antonio. So, stay on, stay on stage. François joined the team at the beginning of my last term. So in, uh, in 2019, he replaced Olivier Derwin, who had been the, the, the anchor of the first edition of the conference. And I told François, if you come, well, your main task during this term will be to organize the second Beyond Growth Conference in the European Parliament. That was 2019. And then, of course, COVID struck. But the work has already, had already started, so don't believe that it was just waiting for COVID to be gone. But of course, it was a bit frustrating because it was start-stop, you know, ah, are we going to get out of confinement? Do we do it? No. At the end of, uh, of uh, 2021, we feel, okay, let's, let's try maybe spring 2022, and then, yeah, that, that's too risky, let's do September. And then, uh, yeah, but then, given the size that this was taking, we felt uh, we might not have enough time to prepare. So spring 2023, it will be. But so ever since, Francois has been working on that. And then two years ago, Lea joined. Uh, Lea is a sort of a superstar hired by the French delegation of the, the Green Group in the European Parliament. But actually, they were well, not really realizing the treasure that she is. Uh, and therefore, I found... Well, I think that I have a good idea where her, her, her skills and immense talent could be put, uh, uh, put to good use. And uh, you joined the team, and, well, I've never regretted it, of course. But I must say the French delegation was helpful in making this happen. And so it's basically more than two years of work by two individuals making this thing happen. So it's not a small thing. And so doing that every six months, that might be a bit of a challenge. <laughs> Mino has been on the team already uh, since a long time. He has managed uh, a lot of well, what you see on Slido and, and technicalities, uh, well, all the, the IT and social media stuff happening behind was pretty much Mino's work. Uh, so thank you for all of this. So thank you again. And finally, it's you. It's you. Uh, you cannot imagine the energy that uh, well, you've gave, g given me, but I think everyone, uh, this is really a matter of shared energy, you know. 2,536 people registered to come in the building. 4,920 people registered to follow from remotely, and by the way, there was no mandatory registration for those who followed remotely. It's remarkable that we are all here united in diversity, and some might say not enough diversity, and that's a good lesson maybe for next time, representing academia, civil society organizations, trade unions, businesses, not many of them. Only one business federation accepted to work with us, SME United. Shouldn't be a surprise, because SMEs are often on the losing end of this extractive system, actually, because they are exploited themselves by the mega concerns of this planet. EU national institutions, youth movements, or simply citizens who wanted, to, to, who wanted it to be here uh, with us. I loved this intergeneration audience, and without being patronizing, I find it remarkable that so many young people uh, uh, came here. To me, it's really a beacon of hope and provides us with incredible energy. Because we together are sending a message to political parties, including mine, uh, starting by saying, it's the economy, stupid. <laughs> you are show showing that we can and should discuss this central topic, that you are not fooled by the rhetoric of too many policymakers about growth, about that you demand that they listen to what science has to tell us. Indeed, we need fact science-based policies. That's what we need, and basically that's what they tell us. Huh? When they want to authorize GMOs, they say, well, it should be science-based, huh? actually. That, that's uh, that's the, the science that, uh, that, uh, that uh, serves them. Well, paid science, huh? I mean. Um, so we need to change all this. We need, basically, to live well within planetary boundaries. We need social justice, right? Justice. This is what we need. Uh, we, want, we want a future for all of us uh, and those who will come after us. Now, thanks having been extended, let me share with you a few thoughts as to what would be next. First, what did I sense in this room? I sense three things. 
you might say, okay, uh, Cartesian way of going about stuff. First, a sense of gravity. I keep in mind two pictures. One was shown by Yamina Saheb, comparing the world my generation, the generation of my kids, and the generation, sorry, of my grandkids, uh, Eflicht of we live in. And the one by Johan Hochstrom, so, so showing how much we already overshoot six of the nine planetary boundaries. This is sobering. It may even be distressing. But you know, changing the world demands that we start by taking a hard look at reality, however frightening it is. I also felt, and Anuna reminded us of it, as well as Agatha, a sense of impatience, and I would even say anger. It was 1972? What? I was then nine years old when the limits to growth report was issued. Science was then already warning us of the deadly contradiction between growth and life. And the first alarm bells, actually when you think of it, had already been sounded by Rachel Carson 10 years before with a silent spring, 1962, the year before I was born. Over those 60 years, a choice has been made consciously and consistently by the majority, not all, but the majority of those who wield political power to ignore science so as to serve those who wield economic power. I call this not ignorance, I call that utter dereliction of duty. But what I most felt here was a sense of hope, a collective choice, because I think cho hope is a choice, a collective choice to believe that the path can still be found out of the situation we are in. We collectively do not just receive hope from these nice young people, you know. We collectively choose to believe that humanity in all its diversity, and I agree very much of the, with those who say we have to learn from others. Indeed, taking care of Mother Earth, well, other civilizations have maybe done a better job than us Westerners at that. Why don't we try to reinvent? Let's learn, right? We believe we believe that humanity in its diversity as the collective resources of imagination, it starts there, creativity and love to live in peace with and within the nature we belong to. This hope is, I believe, the treasure that we cannot afford to bury, the fire that we cannot let be extinguished if we want humanity to thrive. But as my colleague Martin Hoysik said yesterday morning, Winning the argument will be a struggle. Those who benefit from our extractive and exploitative economy stand to lose a lot, at least in their terms of, uh, 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 in their own standards of wealth. So count on them to be helped by the priests of growth to mobilize all the resources of fear, uncertainty, and doubt to deter our fellow citizens from the urgent change of direction. I think I said it yesterday or the day before. The people who mentioned most the yellow vests to me are the business federations. They want us to look that way, saying, well, you know, be careful, you politicians, to change the system, because these people will revolt against you. Of course, so they distract the attention from the fact that basic exploitation happens at their hands. I hear, I hear voices from the European People's Party, Ursula von der Leyen's own, uh, uh, Sirpa Zaun, and there I must really compliment again Sirpa and, and, and the other uh, two EPP members who have been here, because indeed it takes courage to affirm values, and frankly, Sirpa, it's not of today, huh? uh, I know her since uh, I, I was in the European Parliament, she has stood firm for her ideas, which are really resonating with the ideas that we've had uh, over the three days within a political group. But this, this political party <laughs> is telling us, 
is really going on the offensive, saying, OK, we are losing ground. The farmers are our last uh, stronghold. Let's protect the farmers. So they say, well, if we need to feed the world, we should actually double down on our industrial uh, uh, farming system. Did I hear this well? Actually, science tells us that the 40% of the land, arable land that is degraded, is because of that industrial farming system. So if I have to follow Manfred Weber, well, so the boss of the European People's Party, so if I understand you well, Manfred, the best way to feed the world is to keep killing life in the soil so that it becomes unable to bear fruit. I mean, chercher l'erreur, as we say in French. Huh? I also hear the, and we are discussing fiscal rules soon in the European Parliament, I also hear the ayatollahs of fiscal discipline basically arguing that it would be morally wrong to bequeath the future generations a pile of public debt. Yeah, sure, you're right, Christian Linder. Christian Linder is one of those ayatollahs. He's a finance minister in Germany. Yeah, you're right, Christian. And, well, too bad if the price of that discipline is bequeathing our kids a planet unfit for human life. You clearly... You... Well, these, these ayatollahs have, well, like all ayatollahs, have a, well, quite interesting sense of priorities. I also hear an increasing number of politicians saying that Oh, we have already done such a lot for climate. We should take a pause. <laughs> a pause? You know, we cannot continue constraining our economy by environmental legislation. Uh, we need to give breathing space to our industry. They mean the shareholders, you see. Um, so, yes, Emmanuel, he's my mascot, you know that. Huh? Uh, Emmanuel. He, he, he lives, actually, the number of square meters his house has in Paris, I think, is not really compatible with uh, Beyond Growth Europe. But uh, anyway. Uh, but he's right. He's right. I mean, it is us not understanding him correctly. And oftentimes, he is willing to explain you again. Uh, uh, no, no, you're right. So, if I understand you well, we should ask the planet a pause in its reaction to our massive over-exploitation. You're right, we're going to ask that the planet. And once again, I must say, you prove the immense superiority of your complex thought. <laughs> and, actually, and actually, what I've done here is, I think, maybe using the best or the most powerful weapons against those ideas to show how ridiculous, I would say dangerously ridiculous, they are. Laughter is sometimes the best way to put pay to stupid ideas. <laughs> my, my message is clear. A year from now, the European elections will determine the majority in this House. And however good or good-willed Ursula von der Leyen is, if she does a second term, she needs majorities. She can have the best ideas. She is not, Emmanuel Macron, I'm glad that we don't have an elected queen in Europe. <laughs> we have the leader of a commission which can propose legislation. And we have, of course, to put pressure so that this is good legislation, aiming us at a post-growth Europe. But then again, if there's no majority here and no majority in the Council, we're doomed, right? So we need a majority here that will widen, deepen, and embolden the European Green Deal so, as, so that it puts us on the way towards a beyond growth Europe. But this is a year from now, and I'm sure that you don't want basically to sit there waiting or maybe lobby your local candidates before doing something. So we have work to do together not to lose the momentum of, uh, created by this conference. I don't want this to be just a blip on the radar screen or basically a good memory for me in my last term, you know, to say, ah, I did this, ah, that was nice. Huh? So, um, so let me share a few ideas uh, to keep the energy flowing. First, all the material will be on the website. You might say, well, that is not so important. Actually, it is so powerful as teaching material, as learning material. Uh, let's disseminate it and the speeches that go with it. It's not just a presentation because, you know, some, well, sometimes, maybe often, I'm more inspired by, by the words and sometimes I, I need a slide to back it up. But 
I, I want to feel, you know, the way arguments are presented. I, and there was so much of that, so much of that. So everything will be, uh, will be put on the website of the conferences uh, as, well, as soon as possible. Second, I understood, well, and that was quite obvious, huh, that you want to organize yourselves collectively. So, no, we cannot share the email addresses of everyone with everyone. We have the, uh, the GDPR, so the, the, uh, the regulation on, on data protection that we need to abide by, we, because we abide by the laws when they are for the general interest. Um, uh, so, yeah, so, yeah, if you, if you read that as a sort of plea or endorsement of peaceful civil disobedience, yes, that's it. Um, now, we will find a link on the website uh, to a Slack channel uh, to, for you to register so that people can get in touch with one another. It's managed by the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. I thank them for provi providing the opportunity to ensure that the bridges and ties that were built over the last three days can last over time, because indeed this is a marathon. Now, uh, I must also tell you of stuff that is already happening that was not specially visible. Uh, thanks to the Commons Network, the Green European Foundation, uh, Tim Jackson, and so also a number of MEPs have hosted a meeting of national members of parliament, trade unions, uh, trying with one, one, one aim, replicating this kind of event in national parliaments at national level, so that indeed we multiply the impact. Then something that was even less visible, but which is really, I think, groundbreaking, is something that uh, was organized by the Zoe Institute, the uh, policy labs. What we tried to do there was, behind closed doors, invite uh, at the civil servant level policymakers from Parliament, Council and Commission to try and get deeper into the implications of all this into lawmaking. Uh, I'm not promising you that it will deliver uh, immediately. The thing is that we, are, we have started the contamination. And actually, Zoe has been busy with that for quite a while, and we try to expand on that. And, and these uh, workshops have been very, uh, very efficient. Uh, let me see. Yeah, I'm also almost at the end of it. So, yeah. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, we have a partner there, the European Economic and Social Committee. It's a committee uh, no one speaks about. It's uh, located uh, next door, and uh, it, uh, it brings people from civil society uh, and uh, social partners, uh, basically trade unions, business federations, to discuss economic and social issues. And they ran already an event on these topics uh, a few months ago, and they have been a partner in organizing this one, and I understand they want to be even more a partner organizing the next one. Now, I'm almost there. Actually, we are going to, uh, to finish ahead of time, uh, and that's good, I think, uh, because, well, we've had our, our fair share of talks the last, uh, the last three days. Uh, I must mention the next international degrowth conference that will take place at the end of August in Zagreb, in Croatia. I will be there, actually. Uh, and then, let me finish. This is really the last paragraph of my speech. You know, I told you, a year from now, I will no longer be a member of the European Parliament. That was my choice. Uh, I think 15 years, of which 10 leading my group in this Parliament is enough. Uh, so, I kept the promise I made five years ago, organizing after the first one, the second. Uh, beyond cross conference in the European Parliament, but I cannot make you the promise that I will organize a third one. Now, I have no doubt, talking with people during these three days and actually hearing their reactions, that people in my group will be very, very motivated to organize the next one. So uh, we are going to continue always, always, always in a, uh, sorry to use the word, ecumenical uh, spirit across political boundaries, because I do believe that not only there are actors of change in all political families,
but we need actors of change in all political families if we want this to happen. As far as I'm concerned, rest assured that I will remain committed to our common cause, that is, that we humans can live in dignity and freedom on this wonderful planet. Thank you. Apparently, a 60-year-old white man from Europe can still <laughs> somehow resonate with the spirit of the times. I have, I, I have a friend who actually was a civil servant. He made a new career. A French company uh, made him an offer. Uh, the French company was Total Energy. Uh, <laughs> I promise you one thing. I won't do this. 